So it's my pleasure to be here in person and to chair this, this, this session. Um, maybe uh, I just want to mention that we would like to take a screen, pic, uh, a sc a screen capture of all participants uh, online. And we will ask you to open your camera at the end of the Mirai talks. So thank you to, to, to remain and up to this point and to open your camera at the end of the talk. So the first speaker is, of this session is Mirai Buskemelu. She's a specialist in enumerative combinatorics. Uh, like most of French combinatorialists, she works in a computer science lab, the Labri in Bordeaux. Among the numerous results, some are in particular about connection between enumerative um, combinatorics and the algebraic structure of generating series. Uh, among other combinatorial objects, she studied permutation, Lamar max, self-avoiding paths, and lattice paths confined to cones, which are the subject of the talk today. For a scientific contribution, Mireille has received prestigious prize. And she is member of the, she's a member of the French Academy of Science. And the talk today is about uh, Tuts and Vions. And you can begin. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Frédéric. And thank you to Mark and the whole program committee for inviting me to this uh, edition of A of A. Uh, I'm especially grateful for being allowed to uh, present a talk uh, on Zoom. Of course, it's uh, probably less fun than being there in person, but uh, I think that it is a, a mild uh, discomfort compared to what's uh, expecting us if we just go on uh, in the same fashion as before. So I think that uh, hybrid conferences are a very good thing. Okay, so this being said, um, I want to start. So this talk will be about well, counting problems, mostly counting walks, using a technique that was introduced by William Tutt. And when preparing the talk, I've uh, faced uh, two uh, challenges. So the first one is that to be perfectly frank, this talk is about functional equations, which may at the moment not be your best friends. So I want to try to share the, in fact, the pleasure that I have when playing with them. This is maybe not a, a very easy task. And the second challenge is uh, very different in nature. I was bored with LaTeX and Beamer and wanted to try something else. So I've used uh, this uh, library office impress. It took me 10 times more time than with LaTeX and I'm not totally convinced by the result. Okay, and before I start, I want to beg you to stop me and ask questions when needed. Okay, so my first uh, slide will be a, a warning about this terminology of Tut invariance. So as you probably know, this William Tut was not only a distinguished combinatorialist, but also a distinguished uh, graph theorist. And in particular, he invented uh, generalization of the chromatic polynomial of a graph, which is now called the TAT polynomial. And these polynomials are often called graph invariance. And this is not at all, at all the kind of invariance I want to uh, talk about. As I said, what you will see in this talk is functional equations for enumerative combinatorics. Okay, so here's an outline of my talk. Um, these first um, three sections, they form together a kind of a very thick introduction to the kind of things that I want to talk about, which involve uh, catalytic variables. And then the main mathematical contents is in this section where I will define uh, Tats invariant and show you on one example, in fact, the enumeration of these walks in the quadrant, how you can use them. And I will finish by unzooming and showing you the whole picture of what has been done about quadrant walks and uh, three quadrant walks in the past uh, 15 to 20 years and how Tats invariants fit in this picture. Okay, so in the first few minutes, I want us to stare together at just one equation. And I would like you 
and to get some familiarity with it because it will be typical of the equations we play with. So here it is. So in my whole talk, you will see three variables, T, the main variable. We will always have formal power series in T counting things and X and Y, which are two additional variables involved in the coefficients of this series. And in my equation here, so the main unknown, the only unknown is this series Q of XY, which stands for Q of TXY. So the first thing, the first observation is that this uh, equation defines a unique formal power series Q in T with coefficients depending on X and Y. And the reason for that is that if you imagine so Q to be a series in T, then, uh, well, the first coefficient, that is the coefficient of T to the zero, uh, comes only for, from this term, because this is a multiple of T and these other terms as well. So the constant term must be one. And once you have found this first term, then you can address the coefficient of T so you'll get something from here. This will be x, y times one plus one over y times, okay, one minus one and so on. So here I have detailed the computation of the first two coefficients of Q. And at the end you get one plus t, x, y. And so by, in this way, by induction on n, you characterize, you can compute the coefficient of T to the F. The second observation is that this equation is a bit maybe unusual as it involves certain divided differences. So Q of X, Y minus Q of zero Y divided by X here and its twin in Y here. Sometimes they are called um, uh, discrete derivatives instead. And at first sight, because you have uh, these denominators here, you could believe that the coefficient of t to the n in your series will be some rational function in x and y with powers of x and y at the denominator. But because of this difference, you see here again by induction on n that in fact the coefficient of t to the n is a polynomial in x and y. So here's a bit of notation. Uh, I denote with small letters qijn to be the coefficient of t to the n, x to the i, y to the j in my series. That's the second property. Um, now a bit of terminology. So following uh, Doron Zeilberger, we often say that these two variables x and y, which are really crucial for writing the equation, you cannot do without them are catalytic and what else? Yeah, I guess this is it. So you also, oops, uh -huh, that's interesting. Um, you also notice that um, here, my equation is linear in Q of X, Y. So what I will do now is put together all these terms in Q of X, Y on the left-hand side. So I get here factor one minus T times something. And this uh, purple factor is called the kernel of the equation. And now on the right, all that I have involves these two specializations of Q. Um, so as I said, this is the kernel of the equation, this purple coefficient. And what else, a bit of notation now, uh, I tend to denote for the sake of uh, compactness, x bar, that's one over x, and y bar is one over y. So you see, it makes a smaller equation. And the last thing that I'm going to do with my favorite equation is uh, to multiply it out by x, y. So then what happens is that on the left-hand side, now the kernel multiplied by x, y is a true polynomial, this becomes y plus x. And on the right hand side, well, you have something that is nicely split into function of x plus function of y plus something explicit. Okay, 
So now that we have stared at this equation, I want to tell you that it counts something. And, okay. and what it counts is um, certain lattice walks with steps taken in these uh, set of three steps, northeast, west, south, that start from the origin in the square lattice and are completely contained in the first quadrant of the plane. And I claim that the series Q counts them according to three parameters. First, the length, that's my main statistics, the size, the length, the number of steps. This is recorded by T. And then X and Y record the coordinates of the endpoint of the walk. And so in order to prove this, I'm going to um, start from scratch. That is, I now define Q to be the generating function of these walks. And I want to prove that it satisfies this equation. And the reason for this equation is just a step-by-step -step construction of the walks. So here, what I'm saying is that, well, you always have an empty walk contributing for one. And then all other walks are obtained by starting from a smaller quadrant walk of length n minus one and adding one of the three allowed steps. So this uh, diagonal step you can add to any black quadrant walk. This increases the length and by one and the coordinates of the endpoint by one as well, that's fine. But if you want to add, for instance, a west step, which increases the length but decreases the final abscissa, then you have to be a bit careful because you cannot add it to any shorter black walk like that. More precisely, you cannot add it if your black walk already ends on the y-axis, because otherwise you will exit the uh, quadrant. And so this is why here you see we remove something to the main series, and this something has to be the series counting walks ending on the y-axis. But very conveniently, it turns out from this description of Q, that if you set x equal to zero, any walk that ends at a positive abscissa will have no contribution at all. And so this q of zero y is precisely the generating function of walks ending on the y-axis. And here you have the third move, adding a south step with a symmetric situation and a divided difference again. Okay, so now we know what our favorite equation counts. It counts certain walks in the quadrant. Um, we have an example here. You can draw it a bit differently. This is probably nicer. And as it happens, these walks were studied first by someone named Germain Creveras with his nice mustache in uh, 65. And in particular, in this very long and difficult paper, he proved a nice formula for the number of walks ending at position I0 of a given length. And it's only, I think, 20 years later that uh, Ira Gesser realized that, in fact, the uh, complete series, Q of Txy, is an algebraic series, like I don't know, so the series of dig paths. And what is meant by that is that there exists a polynomial, a non-zero polynomial P, such that P of series and variables vanishes. So after all, this equation, which looks a bit strange and maybe difficult, has an algebraic solution. Okay, so this is it for my first uh, example. And now I would like to show you that it is not an isolated example. There are quite a few other equations with two catalytic variables in the uh, enumerative combinatorics literature. So the first thing that we can do is um, still consider quadrant walks, but change the collection of allowed steps. So this is, again, our favorite equation for these Creveras steps. 
But let's say that we replace the set of steps by these four named after Ira Gessler. Okay, so you have an, again a generating function, let's call it Q again, and you want to write an equation for it by constructing your walks step by step. So now there will be four possible moves and two of them will always be possible. The other two, you have to be careful when you want to perform them. And what you obtain at the end is an equation that resembles the previous one quite a bit, except that this kernel has changed. So it's always one minus T times, well, the description of the four allowed steps. Again, X bar is one over X and corresponds to the West step. And on the right, you see again, these two specializations with the slightly different coefficients. And then there's a, a new term, Q of zero, zero, which comes from this diagonal step. And there's a kind of double counting involved here. So, okay, new kernel, slightly new form on the right-hand side, but basically it's an equation of the same type. And again, uh, everything is known about the corresponding series Q, and again, it is algebraic. And this was proved more recently than uh, Krevera's uh, and Gessler's results. It was proved about 10 years ago by Aline Boston and Manuel Cowers, and a bit earlier, um, Manuel again and Christoph Kutchen and uh, Doron Zeiberger had proved a very nice conjecture formulated by Ira Gessel on the number of walks that end at zero, zero. So the kind of loops, and they are given by those nice numbers with a, an ascending factorial here. Okay, so that's a second example. And I cannot, uh, avoid mentioning the probably the most natural collection of steps, so simple walks, where, well, again, you have a kernel describing the four allowed steps, right, at, right hand side is whatever it is. Um, here, all coefficients are nice, number of walks of length n ending at ij. But this time, the only thing that I want to insist on is that this series is no longer algebraic. But still, it's nice with respect to a certain classification of formal power series, namely it is definite. And I'm now going to define this uh, notion. So as you've heard many times um, in enumerative combinatorics, not only, we like to classify our series uh, in this uh, chest of drawers, which contains four more four main classes of series of increasing generality. So the so I define them here for one variable, but you have corresponding definitions with several variables. So the simplest series, they are the rational ones here. Then come the algebraic series, like for Krevera's walks, Gessel walks satisfying a polynomial equation. Then comes an even bigger class of definite series, like walks with simple steps in the quadrant. And these ones, they are those that satisfy a linear differential equation with the polynomial coefficients. And then comes a fourth and even bigger class of D algebraic series satisfying a possibly nonlinear differential equation. And then of course you have series that just do not fit in this uh, chest of drawers, which are called uh, hyper-transcendental or differentially transcendental. Okay, so let us go back to examples. Another source of examples of these equations in two catalytic variables, uh, arises from the enumeration of still two-dimensional walks, but these times confined to a cone, a non-convex cone consisting of uh, three quadrants. And I will not tell you where this, uh, how this equation arises, but it's again a step-by-step -step construction. Uh, it describes walks that end 
uh, in the upper part, in the U of this cone above the diagonal. And you see, it looks a bit like these quadrant equations that we had, uh, an explicit kernel times the series is equal to some right-hand side where you happily recognize u of x zero, so usual spe specialization. And here, instead of having what you would expect, that is u of uh, zero y, you have a mysterious series d, which in, in fact counts walks ending on the diagonal. And if you're not happy with it, you can specialize this to zero and this will give you d of y in terms of u of zero y. So that's essentially of the same form as before, except that the uh, series in x and y, they are not as nicely separated as before because you have a coefficient x here. Okay, but still that's another example and I will come back to it later. Now, v example. So that's uh, uh, where invariants were actually born. So in 73, William Tutt decided to try to count certain planar triangulations, um, which are properly Q colored. So here, Q is some integer, that's your number of colors. And this series, T, counts according to some variables. Uh, planar triangulations with the proper Q coloring. And so he wrote this equation involving two divided differences. So this one is around one, but uh, this doesn't make any serious difference. I would say that the, the main difference compared to the quadrant case is this term, which is no longer linear. On the other hand, uh, in the main series t of x, y, this is still linear. That is, you have no term t of x, y squared. And then after having written this uh, equation, uh, William Tutt devoted about 10 years and also 10 papers, in fact, to it, the solution to this equation. And the climax of this work was a proof that the uh, interesting specialization of t that is x is one and y is zero, is a differential Lie algebraic series. That is, it satisfies, in fact, an explicit nonlinear differential equation. And on the way to this proof, uh, Tut also proved algebraicity for certain values of Q. So this is my favorite historical example in a sense. Now I jump over what, 50 years, a very recent example related to a stock sorting procedure discussed by Don Knuth in 68. Um, so here you have now an equation in, again, with two discrete derivatives or two divided differences. Uh, and this one, you see, it is no longer linear in P of XY. Is probably not definite, but this has not been proved. And if you want to know what this stack sorting procedure is, so you have your stack here. The permutation sigma is your input to the right of the stack. You will output S of sigma. And the procedure is as follows. So at each time you try to put in your stack the first available entry here to the right and you can only do it if your stack satisfies a kind of a Hanoi tower condition that is the entries are decreasing in the stack so here it's not possible and this means that you have to output the two first and then well again what can i do can i put four in the stack yes so this time you would put four in the stack and uh, these uh, three stack sortable permutations, by definition, they are those permutation sigma such that when you apply three times this stack sorting procedure, you get the identity. And as you can 
probably guess or wonder, I will tell you about one stack sortable and two stack sortable permutations later. And I think this is my last example. So, okay, so now you, you're possibly convinced that uh, these equations occur naturally in um, several classes of problems, that is walks, maps, permutations. And, but you may still wonder why two catalytic variables, could there be five, could there be one? And the aim of this uh, third small section is to answer these uh, concerns. So first, zero catalytic variable. That is, you write directly an equation by putting pieces of your objects together uh, and you have only one variable, t, the main size variable. Well, as you know, the, we are all familiar with many, many objects that are, can be described in this way. Uh, so here I've drawn dick paths counted by length and the corresponding equation. Here I've written an equation for plane trees uh, with nodes of degree five and 18. And in general, any object with a recursive branching structure where the sub pieces can be chosen independently give rise to such a polynomial equation or a system of polynomial equations. Um, here I've mentioned also one stack, stack sortable permutation, which also have some kind of binary structure, which is the same as dig paths. And so obviously when we have no catalytic variable, we are in the world of algebraic series. Okay, so the next step, one catalytic variable. And there again, you can find many examples in the literature and in particular in the enumeration of maps, but this kind, this times, this time, and colored maps, that is, so I, I won't define them. They are graphs embedded in a surface. I think that uh, Marie gives a, a talk on Thursday, Marielle Banque on maps where you will see the formal definition. Um, and so there's many, many families of maps, planar, non-planar, that give rise to equations like this one. Here you have a divided difference at one uh, non-linear equation. And if you're not happy with the, having the divided difference at one, uh, you can get rid of it just by translating your variable. If a of x is m of x plus one, uh, then here, instead of the specialization m of one, you have a of zero and a derivative or discrete derivative at zero. Uh, another example, two stack sortable permutations. And here comes uh, Doron again, who wrote this equation, non-linear, but with a, a discrete derivative at one and just only one catalytic variable. Now for these equations, there is a general algebraicity result, which we proved with uh, Arnaud Gian a few years ago. And this uh, result tells you that if you have any polynomial equation involving, so one main series, A of X, which is a series in T with say polynomial coefficients in X, and then a number, maybe one, but maybe more, a number of series A1 up to AK that only depend on T, no X, and then T and X. And assuming that this, equation is um, well founded in a sense, which is always the case for equations with the combinatorial origin, then in fact, even if it's not obvious, you are still in the world of algebraic series. And then quite a few years afterwards, I learned that this result is in fact, uh, this is a bit embarrassing, uh, a special case of um, hard theorem in algebra proved by Popescu 
and then maybe reproved or corrected, I don't know exactly by Swan. So yeah, so this is a bit embarrassing, but on the other hand, I think our proof is uh, elementary and in particular it's effective. And at the moment it's being uh, made even more effective by Alan Boston and uh, his collaborators who, really, who are really designing um, efficient procedures that starting from such an equation will provide algebraic polynomial equations for say a1 up to ak or a of x. So you see, even with only one catalytic variable, well, we are still in the same class of series. I've told you that with two catalytic variables, this will not be the case. And I've shown you many examples. So I will skip over the case of two catalytic variables and just tell you that some problems um, can be naturally described by D catalytic variables, like walks with the non-negative orthant in D dimensions. And here you get something definite. Another interesting result, which uh, can be also proved uh, starting from such equations is the enumeration of a permutation with no ascending subsequence of length d plus two. And this is just a, a very wild uh, suggestion. We know that when d is uh, zero, one or two, uh, permutations that can be sorted by d plus one stack are described by an equation in d catalytic variable. Who knows? Maybe this persists for higher values of d. Are there? So this concludes my big, bigish uh, introduction. Are there questions so far on this uh, zoo of equations? Questions from Moran. Yeah, there's a question, Moran. Okay. Um, the question might be. You want so, to just come up so she could be. Here. Yeah. Is it just, it's, it's just right. you just oh, okay. Uh, sorry, the question might be very naive. So, in the earlier examples you gave about uh, lattice works, so I noticed that it looks like when it's x, it's east step, and when it's y, it's north step, and when it's x bar, it's uh, west step, and when it's y bar, it's south step, and when it's x bar times y bar, it's like. Uh, southwest step in most of the examples, except one kind of a later example where you have. Um, which, which example? Sorry. Uh, so, in most of the example, if that happens, if I'm not mistaken, but like in one of the later examples. Um, Okay, that's <laughs> that's not a naive question, and it's a very good and acute observation. Thank you. So, in fact, so I'm not telling you how this is written, how this is established, but what happens is that even though we are counting walks with these three steps, and if we were in the quadrant, you would expect to see in the kernel xy plus y, y bar plus x bar, here you see the reverse collection of steps. And this is, this is what happens when you, when you, because there's a deformation of steps involved somehow in writing this equation, and um, I didn't insist on that, but it's true that if you count walks in three quadrants, the kernel that you see at the end is not the one that naturally describes uh, your collection of steps. Good observation. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Yeah? OK. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, so maybe now I'm getting to the main uh, part of my talk about these 13 variants. So we will work with some of these equations. So in this slide, I'm telling you what, what I want to hold. So I want my equation to define a series A, a series in T with say polynomial coefficients in X and Y. I want my equation to be linear in A of X, Y. That is, for instance, this will not include three stack sortable permutations. And then I want to have these two divided differences, say at zero of first order. That is, I don't want to iterate divided differences. So my equations, typically, they would look like that. The main series A times x, y, this x, y comes from the divided differences after multiplication, times a certain kernel, which in all my equations reads 1 minus t times x bar y bar times a polynomial in everything else, is equal to a right-hand side that is also a polynomial in everything else. So uh, this is just a the general form of my equation. In fact, I don't need to give more details because I'm not able to state a very general result that would tell you, oh, for any group, any equation satisfying this, this, and that, then touch invariants give this and that. So this is just a, a rough description of the equations we play with. So here is again this general form. So uh, the equation we've played with at the beginning uh, is definitely of this form, q times xy times kernel. And the kernel has the desired form, 1 minus t x by y, y bar times a polynomial is equal to a polynomial. And then the historical example of Tuts triangulations uh, is also of this form form, so this is the original equation, um, I set u equal to 1 plus x to have the desired form. And then, so I have my main unknown here times xy times the kernel, which now involves a specialization of a, but that's fine, is equal to some polynomial expression in everything else. Yeah. So now one additional feature of the equations that we look at is the following. So you have this kernel, and if you compute its reciprocal, and you expand it as a power series in T, so maybe we should look at the example of simple walks in the quadrant. So here is the kernel, I expand it in T. So the coefficient of t to the n, it will be in general a rational function in x and y. And you see here, say around x equals zero, you have a pole of order n in this coefficient. Same in y. And so in general, in all our equations, one over k, when you expand it as a series in t, you have rational coefficients with poles of unbounded order at zero. That is the order of the pole here, n, increases with n. And now I can define in, a, in modern terms what are Tutt's invariants. So here is the main definition of the talk. If you take a pair of series, I have xj of y, so they are both series in T. And the first one, I, has rational coefficients in X, and the other one has coefficients in Y. This forms a pair of invariants if, when you take the following ratio, so you take the difference, I minus J, and divide it by the kernel. So you see, we have 1 over K. And then somewhat miraculously, this series has now poles of bounded order at zero, PBO. So let me again show you examples. Uh, one over K, 
for the simple walk, we have just said that the poles at zero, they are of unbounded order. So this is not PBO. If I now take this series in T, rational coefficients in X and Y, well, in X, I have no pole at zero, but in Y, I have a pole of increasing order of order N. So this is not PBO again. My third example, the coefficient of T to the N is rational function. Here, I have a pole of high order at minus one, but that's no problem. I just want to look at poles at zero. And well, I have a pole of order two in X of order five in Y, but this is bounded uniformly in N. So this series is PBO. So returning to this definition, the first example tells you that if I take I to be one and J to be zero, so I minus J is one, then the pair one zero is not a pair of invariants because it's not PBO. Okay, so that's a counterexample, and you'll probably want to see examples rather than counterexamples. So let me show you first very simple example. So I take this kernel, which is related to counting walks with the simple steps in the quadrant. Well, you observe that this kernel can be written as a function of x minus a function of y. So it reads i of x minus j of y. And what we are saying here is just that i of x minus j of y, that's this, divided by k is just one. So returning to this general form, uh, this one is certainly a series with poles of bounded order, given that it has no pole at all. And so we conclude that just by looking at the kernel for this problem, we have exhibited a pair of rational invariants. This was easy. Now there's other quadrant models that admit admit a pair of rational invariants, even if it's less obvious. So for instance, if we take our favorite uh, Kreverhas steps, this is the kernel. And there I claim that if you define I0 in J0 to be this Laurent polynomial, then if you sit down and compute the difference I0 minus J0, you will see that the factor k occurs. And after dividing by k, you're left with well, a Laurent polynomial in T with poles of order two at zero. And so again, we are in the situation where i minus j over k is PBO. So these Kreveras walks from the kernel, from the explicit kernel, you can form a pair of rational invariants. So that's one way of constructing invariants when the kernel is explicit. Sometimes it's not explicit, it involves the main unknown series. Okay, so this will be more difficult. And now there's an other way of forming invariants, sometimes, from the whole functional equation. So I stick to these Kreveras walks with these three steps. So that's our main character. And we would like to construct invariance now involving the series Q just by staring once again at this equation. So here to the left, we have a nice multiple of K. Q has polynomial coefficients, so no poles at all. And on the right, this is nicely split as I of X minus J of Y except for this uh, annoying term x, y. However, if you just look at the description of uh, k, at the polynomial k and the description of the walks, you observe that this x, y can be written itself as 
function of x minus function of y plus a simple multiple of k. So now from this, you can take your equation, rewrite x, y in this form, put this multiple of k on the other side of the equation. And what you end up with is that k times a certain series with polynomial coefficients in x and y is of the form i of x minus j of y for this value of i and j. So really, you recognize in i1 this term plus a little bit of that. So now we have obtained for this model a second pair of invariants now involving the series Q, the unknown series Q. So what are we going to do with that? Well, the objective in that approach is to construct maybe by combining here are two pairs of invariants. So we had a rational pair, I0, I0 J0 and uh, more mysterious one involving Q. And we would like to build certain invariants that we may call strict. And from this, we will derive some information on Q of X zero. So let me clarify this. So first, this bottom lemma tells you what I mean by combining two pairs of invariants. It is easy to prove that if you take these two pairs and make uh, component wise sums or component wise products, you still get a pair of invariants. So for instance, i1 squared, j1 squared is a pair of invariants. So you can really combine polynomially any pair of invariants or any family of invariants uh, to get new invariants. And now the first lemma, which is also simple to prove, um, tells you about a strong way of being invariants. So assume that you have a pair ij of invariants. And so you look again at this ratio i minus j over k. So by definition, it is p bit go at zero. But assume that in, in fact, not only it has powers of bounded order at zero, but in fact that it vanishes at zero. So in a sense, we have very strict invariants. So what it means, is that i minus j over k expands as a series in t. The coefficients are rational in x and y. And what you want to have in each coefficient is a factor x, y here. Well, so they could be called strict or strong invariants, but in a sense, they need no name because the lemma tells you that, in fact, there is no such pair of invariants except for the trivial ones. That is i of x and j of y, they are the same series, a series that does not depend on x and y. So it's just a series in T. And in particular, the ratio is zero. So now in Tut's approach, the idea is to combine polynomially these two pairs of invariants to form a new pair, ij, that is strict and hence is trivial. So this is what we are going to do on these Tut's, uh, Tut's Creveras walks, um, starting from the two pairs that we have obtained. So again, we have here a rational pair of invariants with the corresponding ratio. To the right, we have the pair of Q invariants with the corresponding ratio. And we want to combine them. So this will be probably the most uh, technical slide in my talk, so bear with me. Um, so we want to form a polynomial combination and the conclusion, so we will obtain a pair of invariants i j and the conclusion will be that i of x in fact does not involve x 
So at the moment, our I0 and I1, uh, they involve X and they even have uh, poles at zero. A double pole for I0, a simple pole for I1. And so maybe an idea, if we want to get something that's trivial, is first to get rid of this double pole. But if, if you square I1, you will get a double pole here. And if you subtract this I0, you have got rid of the double pole. And in fact, if you look at this carefully, you have also got rid of the simple pole. So that's one observation. Maybe it would be worth considering the pair IJ defined as I1 squared minus I0, same for J, just because, well, by construction, they have no pole at zero. Okay, so let's do that and compute the ratio I minus J over K using these elementary ratios. And in fact, when you do that, you realize that indeed, this I minus J over K has a factor X, Y. So vanishes at zero. And so they form a pair of strict invariants. And by this invariant lemma, we know that in fact, this I of X, which looks as if it would depend on X, is a constant function of X. So for instance, it is equal to I of zero. And so we can rewrite this. So this is I of X in terms of Q. And this is its value at zero. So let's summarize. So we started from our favorite equation in two catalytic variables involving Q of X zero, Q of zero Y, and of course Q. And using invariance, we have been able to derive this equation, which only involves Q of X zero and Q of zero zero, and this contains only one of these catalytic variables, namely X. And so I told you that equations in one catalytic variable have algebraic solution systematically. And indeed, you can solve this. And I just show you the, the final result, namely that this Q of X zero is some series of um, or degree six expressed in terms of a series Z that is cubic. Okay, so that was the application of um, that's invariance to this Creveras works. And now, so this is just an example and you may wonder how general it is. And I want to give you the, the true picture at least for quadrant walks. So the story goes as, as follows, about uh, 20 years ago, I started to be interested by these quadrant walks and intrigued by the fact that some had algebraic solutions for reasons that were not combinatorially obvious, some were definite. At the time, the only the, all the examples that we knew of were definite. And uh, so I started to investigate that and a bit later with Marni Mishna, we decided to really look, address systematically all quadrant walks where the set of allowed steps, which we often call a model, is included in this collection of eight steps. And so in principle, there's two to the eight different questions to look at, but in fact, some of these uh, models are trivial or they are equivalent to a half plane problem and hence they have an algebraic generating function. And so we showed that there's really 79 interesting questions to look at. And we wanted to approach them systematically by writing a functional equation like that. And now I'm skipping over the next 20 years. And I just to tell you that the classification of these uh, 79 models is now completely achieved. And they split into two blocks. So there's a collection of 23 models for which a certain group 
that can be defined from the collection of steps is finite. And these correspond exactly to um, the cases where the series Q is definite. And then in each of these two blocks, you have a further refinement. Here to the left, you have four algebraic models, including Creveras steps and Gesell steps to others. And here you have uh, a collection of nine models, which of course are not definite, but are still de-algebraic. So in my fourth um, drawer in my hierarchy. And the, a very nice uh, point in, in, in this classification is that these uh, questions and these decently simple equations, they have attracted quite a large number of contributors coming from various fields in computer science and mathematics. And each of them came with his or her own tools. And this um, classification now uses a, a whole variety of, of methods of approaches and some of them highly so sophisticated like this uh, Galois theory of uh, difference equation. And so this forms now, uh, I think, a, a, a wonderful collection of results, which I, I like a lot. So here's again the classification. And now where are invariants in this? Well, it happens that this classification completely parallels the classification that you obtain when you ask for every such model whether there are rational invariants and whether there are Q invariants. That is, your series is definite and you have a finite group if and only if you have rational invariants like my I0, J0. And among these models, the ones that are algebraic are exactly those for which you have invariants involving the series Q. And here, same to the right. So that's something we proved with uh, Olivier Bernardi and Kylian Rachel. And in particular, we proved in a uniform manner that these four models, they are algebraic. And we proved this using invariance and using a, a weaker notion of invariance. In fact, we also exhibited uh, the algebraicity for these nine models. And more recently, the same question have been asked for walks in a non-convex cone, avoiding a quadrant. And as I mentioned, so some of them, so there's now 74 interesting models, some of them, in fact, 10, can be described by an equation with two catalytic variables. And these 10 models have been also completely classified and solved. And again, you have the same phenomenon. So those that have rational invariance are the definite ones. And among them, those which have invariance involving the main series U are the algebraic ones and same here. So that's something that I did last fall. And um, in fact, these uh, three models, they are transcendental, they are not algebraic, but they have still something algebraic in them. And I was able to prove using invariance that two of them are definite transcendental. And I cannot, uh, I cannot not mention a very strong and nice result obtained recently by Andrew L.V. Price this spring, in which he proves that this persists namely that if you take your favorite collection of steps, of small steps in the quadrant, um, then, well, small steps, then the generating function of quadrant walks using these steps and the generating function of three quadrant walks, they are of the same algebraic and differential nature, at least with respect to X and Y. Okay, so I'm probably a bit late, so I will skip this and finish with some perspectives. Um, there's certainly 
So there's more algebraic models in three quadrants. And in particular, I guess I would like to prove using invariance or in fact, any, any way that this uh, Gesell steps, they are also algebraic in three quadrants. Uh, with a student, Pierre Bonnet, we started to investigate quadrant walks with larger steps. And again, there are some algebraic cases which apparently can be proved using invariance. I'm also curious about three-dimensional walks and moving from three to two catalytic variables. And I will start with a question that's a completely different nature. Um, I've told you, you take your functional equation and then you massage it in some way and you can exhibit um, invariance sometimes. And this part is highly non-automatic. And uh, it would be uh, very nice if part of it at least could be made automatically. And there's some uh, first work in this direction by uh, Manfred Buchacher, Manuel Kauers, and Gleb Bogudi. Okay, and I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, I can't and I can't hear very well the question. Could you are you talking in the table? And I thought, yeah, if you if you just stand here, she would. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this might be another naive question. So, for all the models under consideration, looks like we're always considering the set of minimal possible sets in the sense that you know that can be replaced by a combination of other sets. I was wondering if we would consider the selection where more than the minimal number of. I'm absolutely sorry. Could someone repeat the question? Because I, it was um, like blurred. Thank you, Frédéric. Oh. Merci. Okay. So in French, ça va aller plus vite. Tu, tu, tous les exemples considèrent, mm. que tu considères de marche cons, euh, utilisent un nombre minimal de, de pas au sens où tu ne peux pas remplacer un pas par une combinaison linéaire d'autres pas. Et donc, est-ce qu'il y a des, des modèles où on considère un, un nombre non minimum de pas uh, Thank you. <laughs> thank you for, the, uh, for repeating the question. I, I'm sorry, I still encourage you to ask questions. Um, so, so yes, maybe in my in the cases that I shown, these uh, set of steps were minimal in in a certain sense. But this uh, need not be the the case. For instance, you could consider the king walks where you allow all uh, eight nearest neighbor steps, and this in fact has been done for the uh, walks in a quadrant, for walks in uh, three quadrants. And we are systematically in this um, in this uh, definite transcendental cases case for both problems. So this is just by accident. If my models uh, did satisfy this property. I have one question about the last result you mentioned about LV price. Yeah. Uh, can you say something about the, the ingredient of the proof? Yes, I can. <laughs> there are many ingredients. It, it's a, a truly remarkable work that, in fact, Andrew presented last uh, Friday at some seminar in Paris. Um, I would say that one main ingredient that is um, immensely different from what you've seen in this talk is that Andrew works in some analytic setting. And this, uh, so this kind of approach also exists for quadrant model and was developed by Kilian Rachel and Irina Kurkova uh, 
inspired by some analytic work in probability theory on the stationary distributions of uh, walks in the quadrant. That was that is the work of uh, Fayol, uh, Jasnogorodsky, and Malyshev. So really, this is these. So first, this t our main variable is no longer a variable; it's set to some uh, small real number. And now the series q or u are considered as some function, analytic function of two variables x and y. And this really involves analytic ingredients like uh, meromorphic continuations and um, systematic use of elliptic functions that's, uh, that's central in these approaches. And uh, yeah, so that's, so if I, if I wanted to advertise the kind of techniques based on basic algebra on uh, form of our series, uh, one advantage is that when they work, so first they are more elementary and for instance, they give examples, they give results on the dependency in the variable T, which basically escape these kind of analytic approaches. So yes, um, but this is still very great work. Good question. Real online questions? Okay, so thank okay, you. Hello. Okay, ah, hello. Okay. No, 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 no. There is a Svante. Yes. Ah, hello. Yes, yes. So, uh, hello, uh, Mireille. So, in your discussion of your 79 different uh, cases, uh, you mentioned also briefly that there was some uh, group in, uh, involved there, which you didn't have time to say anything more about. But uh, you said that this group was finite, finite in the cases when, uh, when your model was definite. Uh, your series was definite conversely. Is this group something that appears also in other uh, other of, uh, cases here, or, or was that special for uh, these walks in the plane? Um, so these groups, so first I should tell which its nature is. So it is a group of uh, rational transformations of X and Y. It's uh, generated by two rational transformations that you can combine and iterate. Uh, it is closely related to the fact that our kernel is um, explicit. I wouldn't be able to construct such a group, for instance, if I started with the third equation for triangulations. And in so, we have such a group for quadrant models, for three quadrant models. And another difficulty, if you try to go beyond these cases, um, is that it, um, it really uses the fact that you have small steps. That is, uh, it's not as easy to define something like a group if you have, say, walks in the quadrant with larger steps. That is, you would have a kernel that has maybe degree larger than one or valuation less than minus one. And we did that. We started to, to work on that with the uh, Aline Bostan and Steve Melcher. So we have something like a group. In fact, we do not really have a group, but we have something that resembles its orbit uh, in the case of larger, larger steps for walks in the quadrant. But yes, this is this is rather specific to having small steps and an explicit kernel. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? No, so thanks again, Mireille. Merci.